And the uh, panel members that are here is Paul Hammer, Professor of New Testament, United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities, belonging to the United Church of Christ. He's on my far left. And next to him is Vince Rossetter, Sr. He's president of the Bank of Hardington, Nebraska. And he's a member of the Catholic Church. And right next to me is George Donahue, professor of sociology and the head of rural sociology, University of Minnesota. He's a layman in the Episcopal Church. And myself, E.W. Mueller, secretary of town and country churches, National Lutheran Council. And we will be discussing the general topic of community development. And we're going to zero in on the specific issues that deal with community development. But before I do this, and before we go on discussing of these topic, this issue, I would like to extend an invitation to all of you to come to the Farm Seminar, which will be held at 8 p.m. Saturday at the Festival Hall NDSU, where some of these issues will be further dialogued. Now let's get into our general topic. And the topic I'd like to discuss with you as a basic issue is resignation or renovation of our rural communities, or we might also say revitalization. Or another way of saying it, are we going to accept change and adjust to it? And I would say, ask you, Vince, being a banker in a rural community, what do you see and view as happening in rural areas? Well, there's been a general deterioration in the rural areas in the past several years, E.W. I think it's apparent in most rural areas. I know it is in most rural communities. We've lost population, we've lost customers, and there's been a general decline. We've also suffered, I think, rather uh, disastrously from a declining farm price level. Oh. It has, uh, our economy has survived uh, in rural America as well as it has because we have had unusually large volume of physical production. Well, is this a trend that's going to continue, or is it a trend that rural people can do something about it? Or uh, what, what do, we, do we do? We just uh, sort of sit down and take it? Resign to it? No, I don't think we can resign to it, and I don't think we should, because I think the things that are coming from the exodus of rural farm families and rural town families uh, aren't necessarily good for the urban economy, because it is uh, putting pressure on unemployment, it is uh, creating problems of housing and schooling and new churches in the urban areas, and I don't know that it's good to uh, reconstruct all of the facilities of the rural areas in the metropolitan areas because it isn't come from it isn't coming from natural or normal causes it's coming from a, a direct underpayment uh, of uh, the rural economy well, these I'll people are being forced out let me uh, butt in here now however these changes that have come largely because probably of uh, new machines technology these are changes that rural people however have more or less asked for in other yes. words, no one told them that they had to buy a seven-bottom plow or uh, new equipment. They more or less chose this. Now, uh, what is, uh, who initiates change, or what does change really deal with? George, would you want to come in on that one? Uh, I, I'd like to come in on that one, but I'd like to go back to something Vince said, because it's okay. very interesting. Vince said that the uh, only reason the rural areas have held, held their own uh, relatively well over the past few years is by tremendous volume of physical production. Now, Vince... You're a banker, and I'm sure uh, an economist uh, to boot. Most of our economists indicate to us that uh, a great volume of production depresses the price. Perhaps this great volume of production, instead of saving rural areas, might have been one of the reasons for the relatively depressed price level. Undoubtedly it is, George, and I think we're at a place now in our American economy where we have to learn to deal with abundance. We can't let the law of supply and demand, or the so-called law of supply and demand, as I put it, uh, just run rampant. Uh, we're consuming the goods that are being produced in agriculture, but we're not consuming at a, at a high enough price to keep rural America prosperous. We can afford to pay rural America what we should pay in order to keep it prosperous and to slow down, and I don't mean stop the exodus of uh, rural people into the metropolitan areas, but at least bring it back to something more normal. Uh, the scale before uh, or shortly after World War II when we did have prosperity in agriculture. Well, the deal with our mass production, as you're saying, Ben, is they, are we going to let everybody uh, decide is what he's going to do, or will this not require a group decision? And we get into group decision, does this not more or less violate some of our basic ethical principles of individual responsibility? 
Yes, it does. Uh, it, it's away from uh, our rugged individualism, but, uh, and it has gotten so bad now, I feel, that uh, the ordinary groups and organizations that we have available to us uh, in rural America that are dealing with this problem uh, probably can't handle it by themselves. They are probably going to have to have uh, intervention by government, and I think this uh, would be acceptable with the knowledge that when we can learn to handle it ourselves, that the government will step out, and the government usually has done this. Now who makes the decision? I mean, the... The, uh... the decisions are going to have to be made, I think, in, in the public interest uh, as much as they're going to have to be made in the, in the farmer's interest, in rural America's interest. And uh, these decisions can only be made objectively uh, by the government, I believe. Paul, uh, he, Vince has told us that these must be made in the interest of the public interest. Uh, who determines what is public interest? So what well, measuring stick do we use? Who, uh, 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 do we do it because of uh, a certain group, or uh, is there a more basic responsibility? Well, it seems to me that, that one of the important factors here is that, uh, uh, is that we come to see that we are, are working together, all of us, on a particular problem. Uh, you take, for instance, now the individual family. Uh, it isn't there that, uh, that one person in the family determines everything that is to happen within that family, but that it is a matter of each member of a family contributing to an understanding of how they are going to meet a new crisis or a new problem within that family. But by the same token, it seems to me that, uh, that if we're going to move towards a solution of the, of the farm problem, uh, it's going to take the kind of, of, of dialogue, the kind of discussion not only among farmers uh, and various farm groups, but uh, in relationship to the total economy of the nation uh, so that uh, we don't come with, uh, as farmers with, with our uh, convictions and, uh, and uh, everybody is to adhere to this, but rather we seek uh, more and more to listen to one another. And it's going to take the farmers, it's going to take the producers of agricultural machinery, it's going to take the instruments of government, I think it's going to take a look at the whole world economy. Because when we stop to think that we have overproduction in this land, and yet that while we're talking here this morning, 300 well, people will like die. Good, pious you talk. See? It sounds like good, pious talk. But do rural people have the capacity, because of their background and their history, see, do they have the capacity to take that broad uh, look? I agree with you, they ought to, see. But will they? And uh, they, well, uh, they are pretty... Uh, let me inject a comment here, because, Paul, I think the, your uh, desire for consensus, your desire for togetherness, your desire for understanding uh, are very laudable. However, I think a realistic view of society doesn't indicate that we even have the opportunity to sit down with one another, except in the forms uh, that our leadership may uh, sit down and uh, have consensus with one another. I think we're a multi-group society. We're growing more and more into a, a splintering of special interest groups because of the diversity of our economy as a whole and the complexity of the economy. So I think if what uh, you're speaking about uh, might have been possible in the days where we had a sort of a homogeneous mass of individuals on subsistence farms where they had uh, interest in common and values in common with one another. But this isn't the matrix of modern society at all. Uh, there are conflicting points of view points of view which are diametrically opposed uh, in labor and management, for instance. Certainly there are areas of consensus between labor and management. There are areas in which, let's say, the farm interest group is diametrically opposed to the non-farm interest group. But there are areas where they have a common ground and a common interest. And I think that what we're going to have to deal with is the fact that some of these conflict, ish uh, conflict issues are going to be have, have to be resolved by uh, some reference to the public interest which you speak about, Vince. There has to be an arbiter. Anytime you get a complex society where there's a diversity of interest which exists, then the public interest becomes a concern of government. And this is why I think you, you said that you'll have to have some government intervention in the long run. You have it now. Right. The question is whether, we, uh, whether the type of intervention we have now is the type that we should have in the long run. I would say this is a basic problem. The rural people have accepted technology. They made this choice not just now, but way back, see. And they have therefore gotten into the position of mass production. But I don't think that they really know what the, uh, the, the uh, basic issues are or the implications of having accepted or made those choices of mass production. In other words, 
As I observed the farmer, he's very efficient and productive in the area of producing stock and cattle and so forth and so on, see. And here he's made his uh, acceptance. But I would say he hasn't to produce structures in the area of marketing, for example. See? And, uh, and I don't think that, uh, that he has the capacity. For example, when he works in the area of production, he works primarily with cattle, with soil, with plants. These don't talk back. But as soon as he moves in the area of marketing, he has to work with people. And I don't think that the rural person has perhaps the capacity, but training or background to, to really deal with people because of his strong individualistic approach. Uh, allow me the mic once again. He has the capacity. He has a trained incapacity is what he has. And this is true of many people in times of change. They have trained incapacities. Trained incapacities in terms of their attitudes, their values, and their skills. Now, the trained incapacity, let's say, of the rural person today is just what we've been talking about. He does not know how consensus is reached in a society made up of diverse interest groups which have conflicts with one another as well as interest in common. He goes back to the uh, rugged individualism you spoke mm -hmm. of earlier. Rugged individualism was particularly appropriate to subsistence farming where an individual could, let's say, stay on his own piece of land and produce whatever he wished, however he wished, and not interfere with his neighbor. Today, however, when we move from subsistence farming, where production was largely, at, at that time, for consumption, to where production is largely for sale, immediately when it goes into the market, there's a common interest here. Mm -hmm. You're influencing your neighbor farmer. You're also having an impact upon the consumer in the urban area. And I would say that this requires some rules and regulations which would do away with the rugged individualism of the past, but would substitute for it individualism based upon interdependence, based upon diversity of interest. Now, if you think the only type of individualism is rugged individualism, based upon property rights where you can do what you wish, then I would say that you divorce at least 90% of the American population from uh, the possibility of ever achieving individualism because most of us don't own producer property and we can't do what we want on our property. We're zoned in certain fashions, uh, fashions, we're restricted in certain fashions professionally and occupationally so that we are continually uh, guarding our own area and being, uh, let's say, uh, restricted from entering the areas of others. Well, George, certain. I'll go along with you to this extent. I think the farmer has the intelligence to understand his problem, but too often uh, he has a long, uh, deep understanding that he feels has been right for many years and he's not willing to look at somebody else's picture. Now, the law of supply and demand, uh, loosely described, is, is functions when you have equal bargaining power on both sides of the bargain, when each group is equally capable of dealing with the other. Now, farmers notoriously have been not underorganized, but overorganized, if anything, probably, but they haven't been organized in a fashion that orients them to this particular problem. Now, the law of supply and demand with equal bargaining power on both sides of the bargain then does result in a price that is fair to the producer and fair to the consumer and in the public interest. And this is where I feel that the government steps into this picture. It but has to make this thing function in order to maintain equity of income in all levels of the economy in order to consume all that we're capable of producing with the labor that we have. Before we go back, we're going to the area of government. Let's go back a minute. You said that the farmer had the capacity, but he had the uh, intelligence, but he had the, uh, he was an untrained capacity. Uh, was he was incapacitated because of prior tradition and heritage. Yes. All right, now let's fix the responsibility for this prior tradition and heritage. Who mistrained him? Or, uh, and if he, so, who should retrain him? The standpoint of now the church who definitely teaches a man has, has individual responsibility. And this is, I would say, been very strong in our Protestant groups. But I would say from the doctrine of creation, we also learn that people are created for each other, see? And that there, anything that the Bible teaches is that it teaches the interdependence of people. And uh, if you said there's mistraining, who failed here, see? And, uh, and how do we get at it? Is it the school? Is it the church? Where, where do we fix the responsibility for this mistraining? And who is the, uh, who's, uh, what are these people, uh, who produced these type of people? It isn't necessarily mistraining at all. It may be mistraining 
let's say, or a trained in capacity for the type of situation which exists today, but it was ideal training for the development of the country because we needed this type of rugged individualism to develop the frontiers. We needed this type, let's say, during the initial periods of the development of capitalism or industrialized society. I think this was a very, uh, this was a driving force, unquestionably, in the uh, motivation and determination of men. The fact is that the socioeconomic structure of the country has changed so that we have to change our concept of individualism. Now, uh, when you say, I think the church was uh, indeed responsible for the training of individ uh, the rugged type of individual, uh, and it's still hallowed for that matter in most rural <coughs> churches today. I mean, uh, uh, you might say, who's going to train the leaders in the church rather than the farmers out on the land at the present time? Uh, whose responsibility is it? Well, it's a society's responsibility. Let's say we have to come to this I think not by any dictate from Washington or St. Paul or from Lincoln, for that matter, but we need to uh, get this through basic understanding and education. And I think these movements in the farm area are provoking people to thought at the present time. If I can interrupt here yeah. just, just a minute here on this, this uh, understanding of the church as somehow being a champion of indiv rugged individualism, uh, I would have to say that that this is really a distortion. If the church has espoused this kind of a, a rugged individualism, it really is a distortion of the basic Old Testament and New Testament perspective of kind of interdependence, E.W., that you were talking about. And it seems to me that unless we can come to see that the primary values uh, in society today are human values, uh, if we make, as it were, uh, a kind of idol of... Uh, uh, of, our, of our pocketbooks and make this the, the primary criterion, as important as this is, ultimately then it seems to me we're, we're going to undercut uh, the, very, uh, the very concerns for, for people that you have mentioned. And I, I think too this whole question of, uh, of a desire to keep the status quo, uh, n no desire for change, we want to get to the good old days or to keep the good old days. But it is, the, it is really the tradition of the whole American history uh, that change is part of this, uh, that the, the, the revolution that really uh, gave us birth has been the very character of the American society. And I think it's interesting to note that, uh, that we're undergoing now a Negro revolution today of involving 22 million people where, uh, where human values as well as economic values are coming to the fore. And with 15 million people on our farms, it seems to me that the same kind of, uh, the same kind of, of revolution, in one sense, is going on here in order that we can arrive now at a new understanding. It's not a matter of various groups trying to find a, a consensus of what they already believe, but rather of each group seeking to, to talk together in such a way that they arrive at a new consensus that conserves the human values, and there aren't any simple solutions to it. In other words, if we're going to, to it. sort of foster and further clear development in the Red River Valley, for example, then we aren't going to be against change to try to bring back the good old days, as you said, the, or try to go back to uh, simpler technology. We'll have to accept the change and probably have even more changes. But we'll, we'll have to make the necessary adjustments. Now, these adjustments will not necessarily just be made in the area of production, but probably in the area of our training and our understanding of uh, new relationships, new social organizations, new, new organizations probably, in order to get the maximum uh, production out of what we have to work with. Well, Doctor, I, I, I may interrupt you. I think that we're overlooking something here, and that is that this, uh, this problem that we have in rural America, the exodus of the people, the vacating of the farms, the enlargement, and et cetera, stems uh, to a large degree from underpricing. Now, for example, you mentioned the Red River Valley, and we are entitled in the wheat areas of the United States today to $2.90 per bushel wheat. If we had earned the same relative income that all other segments of the economy have earned, we're entitled to $3.67 per entitled bushel. Why? Entitled because the other segments of the economy can readily afford to pay us this price. But well, we're getting back to your problem that you mentioned before of marketing. This is the big failure in agriculture. We have failed to come up with a marketing program that will handle abundance of production. We've, our marketing has all been based on scarcity. And we have achieved now abundance not only in agriculture but in every segment of the economy. The other segments of the economy have learned to deal with abundance. 
They can administer their prices. They can regulate their production. Now, farmers must, whether they like it or not, come to substantially the same conclusion, or they cannot participate in the fruits of the economy that the rest of us can readily afford. And this is the thing, I think, that is really the crux of the erosion in rural America. And if we restore the price yeah, level, then we look at the picture again, it'll this, be different. Uh, by this statement that you say entitled, because this means that somebody is going to uh, set the price, and, uh, and for a just price, and I'm for it, but on what basis would you arrive at the price well, that you quoted? Well, let me say entitled, it may have, is all right, there's nothing wrong with that term, but on the other hand, if we're going to consume all of the goods that are available, our share of the goods that are available from the urban and industrial areas, to restore approximate full employment, to restore the other good factors in our economy that prevailed from 1946 to 52. If we're going to do this, then the rural areas have to earn an adequate income to provide the reciprocal market for goods and services, to restore employment, well, to restore production in the factory and things of this nature, to restore the profit level. So your real motive in getting an adequate price here for the farmer is twofold. Yes. First, because of justice for the farmer, but secondly, that he can also uh, buy the products of urban production to further that economy. Right, and now, it's, it's just is as that important. that ideal? Is that simple? I think it's a very interesting approach you have here, Vince, uh, but I, I want to ask you a couple of questions that bother me about this. Um, I think this question of entitlement, I think perhaps you'd agree that if I said equity, because we have right. equity mm -hmm. formulas mm -hmm. already now, and, and these are administered yeah. through various types of uh, voluntary and governmental devices. For instance, school aids are based upon an equity formula for rural versus urban areas in terms of income tax in the state of Minnesota, as well as other states. But apart from that, the thing is, you say that uh, the price factor is the real reason for the deterioration of rural communities. Uh, I think this is nice to believe, and it's nice to believe that uh, if you increase price, you'll retain people in the rural area, and perhaps you will some of them. But the fact is, the, the exodus from rural areas, the out-migration, whether it's in Minnesota or Nebraska or the Dakotas, has been rather consistent. As a matter of fact, during periods of prosperity in the economy, and prosperity in the rural economy in particular, it's even been higher than it has during depressed periods. In depressed periods, you tend to retain people in rural areas because the pull opportunities don't exist in the urban areas. In the, when the whole economy is operating at full tilt, you tend to substitute capital for labor because you can invest at that point in rural areas, and the out-migration continues to the job opportunities in the urban areas. So I would say that the current condition of depopulation in most rural areas and the consolidation of rural communities is not a result of price. It's a result of basic innovation in society. An industrial society, an affluent society, tries to minimize the amount of human effort, labor in particular, in any one area to get maximum return. I would say that uh, this is what is happening in agriculture. But the price is still a factor, George, because, uh, yes. because uh, this added capital investment that has replaced this individual is costing the farmer three and a half dollars an hour, where the individual cost him a dollar an hour. So he still has to have his price. I'm not contending that we can stop the, uh, the out-migration of rural people. I'm saying we can only slow it down to more normal, normal times or normal conditions, such as the post-war period that you mentioned. Now, we were up to 200,000 and 300,000 farm families. 100,000 farm families a year would seem to be somewhat normal. Well, when you talk about price, this is what comes up. How much will the consumer pay? This is what you're, uh, will be heard. And the point is, they, they, if you get too high, you will say you'll price yourself out of the market. Now, I often hear discussions about a responsible role that labor should play, the role, the responsible role that farmers should play, the responsible role that the industry should play. But I seldom hear about what is a responsible consumer. We tend to make the consumer sort of king, see? And is this, is this justified, that whatever he wants is right? Oh, I, uh, that's a whole issue in itself, and I could uh, do nothing at this point but disagree with you. you we'll can. discuss it sometime. Well, the okay. consumer we'll, is we'll not king that. in our economy. We'll, we'll just, but well, I would say we, let, we let me make this, this statement, uh, Dr. Miller. Monsignor Lagudi is noted for a statement he made one time that the consumer who knowingly buys his groceries, shoes, clothing, beverage, and tobacco at a price that doesn't return the farmer an adequate income is guilty of the sin of theft. Now, I don't know how much stronger you can put it than that, yeah. George. Well, I would say, I, if, yeah. I know, if I know that shirts, for instance, have been produced with sweatshop labor, see, I tend not to, abide, uh, to buy them, see. I would also like to not have to buy food, see, that has been produced below cost, see. And I, what I'm trying to get at is, 
that this back to this point of interrelationship that must exist. It is not just a farmer's concern. It's, it's also a concern of the people in the towns and that we must be concerned for each other's welfare and each other's fulfillment. And unless we, uh, again, you said this is idealistic, but I would say the church needs to project that probably which isn't attainable, but it still needs to project it. Well, I think it's a question of what is idealistic and what is unrealistic. And uh, the two, something may be idealistic and it may be unrealistic, but I think we can have realistic ideals in terms of at least target goals along the way to this state of perfection or the ultimate ideals. And I do, uh, I do feel definitely that uh, this question of uh, whether or not the farmer is getting his return is an equity question. It's not a question of the economics of the situation or the technological aspects of change. It is an equity question that you're asking. I don't say the farmer doesn't deserve a greater return. I'm saying under the present methods of operation, he is not getting that return. And in all probability, the way our society operates, he will not get it. And I expect in Minnesota, where we have 145,000 farm operators, we will drop to 80,000 farm operators before this uh, shrinkage of farm families is over. Paul, what role do you see, being at the seminar, what role do you see the church might play more uh, more vigorously in this type of a thing? Or uh, where does it come in at? Well, it seems to me now here again that, that if in the, in the Christian community we espouse a concern for one another, now what better thing could happen that, for instance, here right in the very churches of Fargo and Moorhead, there would be people, farmers, business people, who, who come together to talk through their problems, not just to talk past one another, but to talk with one another, so that the church ought to be a place because of a common kind of loyalty of concern where people really come to grips with these things with something more than a kind of superficial uh, goodwillism, uh, but where they really deal with the issues. And all too often the church has sort of stood on the side as a kind of collection of pious people for certain purposes when it ought to be the kind of a, of a fellowship that, that is concerned about all of these issues in a very concrete way. So in other that, words, the church does not have a pat answer. The church has no pat answer. The church has a concern. Gentlemen, I think our time is out, and I thank you for a very interesting discussion.